Okay, so now that we've, we've established, well, primarily this first basic example, let's return to this limit that we, we looked at and we, we did sort of a, what you might feel is sort of a hand wavy estimation approach. We looked at the sort of the precise approach using the, using the definition. Uh, now we'll show how to do this one using, using this limit here. Once you believe this limit to be true, you can proceed as follows. What we do is we can basically factor out the highest power from the top and the bottom, right? And usually we look for the highest power in the numerator. So we say, okay, so we're going to factor, or sorry, highest power in the denominator. So we say, all right, let's factor. We have, well, the top, I mean, if you like, right here is x squared times 1. On the bottom, if you factor out x squared, well, x squared is x squared times 1. Uh, that 4 would be if you had 4 over x squared and then multiplied by x squared, right? Um, now that we've factored out that x squared, of course, you can cancel it, right? It's a common factor, top and bottom, so we can cancel it out. This is essentially an equivalence, equivalent fractions argument. Okay, but now... We simply got 1 over 1 plus 4 over x squared. And limit laws tell us that we can do the limit of 1 over the limit of 1 plus the limit of 4 over x squared. And 4 is a constant, right? It doesn't matter if I put a constant in here, right? Any constant over a power of x, positive power of x, that limit is going to go to 0. So now I know that the limit is going to be 1 over 1 plus 0. And so, as, as we expected, we get a limit of 1, okay? Um, if you don't like this factoring out x step, if you don't like, if, you know, if you find it hard to think about factoring an x squared out when there isn't an x squared in one of the terms, um, you could also think about just dividing top and bottom by x squared, or if you like, multiplying top and bottom by 1 over x squared, right? Um, however you want to think about that step, you think it doesn't matter, right? The result is still going to be the same. You're going to get to this point. Um, and, and so the point is to end up with, you know, terms, constant terms. Maybe there's some terms that still have an x in the numerator. But we want to get as much as we can with, it, with the power of x in the denominator because we know all those terms are going to go to 0. And from there, we can simplify. Um, so here's a more complicated looking example, right? So in this case, maybe I, maybe I proceed by kind of multiplying top and bottom. So again, the highest power of x that I see, in this case, in both numerator and denominator, is x cubed. Um, so we multiply by 1 over x cubed. And pushing that through, we get 1 plus 2 over x squared plus 1 over x cubed, right, divided by 4 minus 2 over x plus 9 over x cubed. And again, now we can apply some limit laws. This, 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 those terms are all going to go to 0. Simply leaves me with 1 over 4. Okay. Now, in these two examples, we had the same degree polynomial top and bottom. That's not always going to be the case, right? In a lot of cases, um, we're going to have different, differing degrees, either top or bottom. Let's look at one more quick example. Let's say we have something like the limit as x goes to infinity of x over, over x cubed minus 1. So in this case, the degree is, is greater in the denominator. So different people will approach this in different ways. Some people will say, well, you should always just divide by the highest power of x in the denominator. That'll work. Some people will say, no, let's just factor an x out from the, from the numerator. Do it whichever way you want, right? Um, we'll see what happens in either case, right? If, if we just factor out the x from the numerator, right, if we divide top and bottom by x, right, then we're going to be with the 1 on the top. x cubed over x becomes x squared. And then we have a 1 over x. 
And, and now we could say, well, okay, that one over x is going to zero, leaves me with that one over x squared, that's kind of going to go to zero as well. Okay, we expect zero. Or maybe you prefer, we divide everything by x cubed. And then this becomes one over x squared on the top, one minus one over x cubed. This one's a little bit more clear cut, right? Now we can see that that's going to go to zero. That's a one, that's a zero. So we get zero over one minus zero, which is zero, right? And we've got our limit. Okay. So anytime you get a great, higher degree on the bottom, that limit's always going to be zero. Um, the one that we didn't do, and the one that we probably shouldn't try to squeeze into this video because we don't want to get too long, is what if the degree is bigger in the numerator? So what if I had, say, like an x cubed up here? Well, if I had an x cubed up top, then I would still have an x in the numerator here, right? So then I would have x over, over something which is roughly 1, right? x is going to infinity, then the limit is going to be infinite, right? Um, and so... Basically, there are three different cases. They're summarized in the book. There's a nice uh, statement in the book. It's stated as a theorem covering the three cases. If the degree is bigger on the bottom, the limit will always be zero. If the degree is bigger on the top, the limit will always be infinite. Um, you still have to pay attention to whether the limit is going to be plus infinity or minus infinity. And that might, that's the one case where it's actually going to depend on whether x is going to infinity or minus infinity, right? If it's a greater degree in the numerator. Um, if the degrees are the same, as we saw in these examples, and it's not too hard to generalize and figure out what's going to happen um, in general, is going to be once you've canceled out that highest power of x, you're just going to be left with the coefficient of the top power in the numerator divided by the coefficient of the top power in the denominator, as we see here, right? 1 over 4, right? And that means that these limits of rational functions where x is going to infinity, once you, once you kind of understand that there are these three basic cases, you don't really have to do work. You know, you know there are these three cases. You can just write down the answer. You can say, here's the answer. I know that's the answer because we have this theorem in the textbook that says, you know, there are these three cases. I'm in this particular case, so I know that has to be the answer, right? There's, there's not necessarily any need to go through all these steps unless you're explicitly told that you have to do it for a particular exercise.